Pregnancy and Birth The Truth will tell you everything you need to know about pregnancy, birth and beyond. You'll get the facts from our experts, midwives and doctors, as well as essential words of wisdom from the women who've been there and know the truth. Coming up in this programme, baby's cord around the neck. Is it something to fear? It's a cause of concern for parents because it feels a little bit like strangulation or, or hanging or something like that. In fact, the cord is often very long and is often wrapped around the baby in many ways. Discovering you're pregnant. I wake up the next morning, have a very strange taste in my mouth, a metallic taste. And I also feel something go and pop and flutter in my tummy. But first, thrush. Thrush is a very common yeast infection, which many women may be familiar with. It can occur any time, but during pregnancy or after the birth, it seems to be more common. The treatment is usually with pessaries and creams, which can be bought over the counter in the pharmacy. Your partner will also need to be treated to prevent reinfection. You can apply live yoghurt. It's important the yoghurt doesn't have any sugar in. Um, lots of people will swear by taking acidophilus, um, which you can get capsules from your pharmacy or, the, or particularly health food shops. To help prevent thrush, or to keep it under control, it's advisable to wear cotton underwear, try not to wear tights or tight trousers and jeans, and avoid heavily scented bath oils and soaps. Some women find that adding a few drops of vinegar to the bath water may help to relieve symptoms. The other things, obviously, you can go to the chemist and get um, a caniston or whatever. You could go to your GP if you need something stronger. Um, cutting sugar out of your diet is helpful. Wheat can also be add to it because it's a yeast and, and the candida is a yeast that will feed on that. Um, Drinking extra water just to help flush everything through, those are all things that can help. During the birth process, the infection may be passed on to the baby, and this will result in small white patches appearing in the baby's mouth. This, in turn, may reinfect the mother's nipples, which can make breastfeeding painful. Esme had the classic white spots inside her mouth and um, sore bottom, throwing up a lot in the evenings, very windy. Um, I had shooting stabbing pains in my boobs in between feeds, after feeds, poor feeds, whenever they felt like hurting basically, um, which is a sign that you've got thrush in the ducts. In the mouth it, um, it's usually detected by white plaques on the side of the baby's cheek or on the gums, um, which you can't wipe off with your finger, often confused with milk, and is treated by an oral preparation of nystatin or dactarin usually. and the other area is in the nappy area where you'll typically find a, a spotty rash um, confined to the nappy area which will be able to be detected by a doctor or a midwife and um, treated with a nice satin cream. But I'm allergic to that so I couldn't take it so I have, I've had to do it via diet which means I've been taking um, an acidophilus supplement, which is all the, the good friendly bacteria, as they say in the adverts, and um, garlic. And I've also cut out dairy, wheat, anything with yeast in it, caffeine, anything with sugar in it, including fruit, for my diet. And it's working, but it's working slowly. And the, uh, I have to be careful with refined foods. I had white rice the other day at a friend's house. And because it's so refined, the, um, the, th the thrush likes that, so it, it thrives again. So I had a recurrence of it after that, so... But we're getting there. There are oral treatments available for use with the baby, and your general practitioner can prescribe these treatments for both you and your baby. Good. <sighs> the cord around the neck is a cause of concern for parents because it feels a little bit like strangulation or, or hanging or something like that. In fact, the cord is often very long and is often wrapped around the baby in many ways, not just the neck but around the limbs. And the cord is beautifully designed that the vessels within it are very cushioned by a kind of jelly surrounding the vessels within the cord, which makes any twisting of the cord very difficult to pull those vessels tight and stop blood going through them. We have three blood vessels, two veins and an artery, and we can see 
Two right there next to each other. So I was in for one of the monitoring um, occasions and they said that the umbilical cord was wrapped around his neck and that most likely he wasn't going to deliver naturally, that I was going to struggle with it. And I did have a clue that there was a problem because uh, I was trying all the old wives' tales, everything that people recommended to us, the eating hot chilies and going for long walks, and I was trying everything to bring him on, and none of it was working. He would drop, my bump would go very low, and we'd go, yay, we did it! That curry tonight did the trick. And then a couple hours after the curry meal, I could feel this bobbing sensation and his head was working its way back up. And all of a sudden my bump was riding high again. And um, I told the doctor this, they thought it was very strange, but it happened for me about six times where the bump would go low and then it would come back up. And what they realized was the umbilical cord was gagging him. And so as he would drop lower, which would be his instinctual um, start for the labor, um, he was gagging and he was pulling himself back up. And at the point that they kind of put the two and two together, and they said, this is what's going on, you're never going to go into labor on your own. I had to go in to be induced. In this birth, the midwives were able to slip the cord over the baby's head. We often see babies with the umbilical cord around the neck as the head comes out um, and in general it does not give any cause for concern. So my first child, Carl, was born in 1997. Um, he was a big surprise because I didn't find out until I was 18 weeks pregnant that I was pregnant which was a bit embarrassing, because I'd always thought, how could people not know if they're pregnant? I've got a cold, that's why my temperature's staying up, and I knew I was pregnant the day after. <laughs> well, you always think you can't get pregnant, and you can. <laughs> so, uh, as far as I was concerned, it was like, that is stupid, I'm not pregnant. You know, it's practically impossible. The doctor was quite embarrassed as well, because he had told me I wasn't pregnant and it was just stress and to stop moaning on about it, basically, about feeling so ill. It was a shock. I mean, we were both really happy. It was a big shock. Big shock. It was a, a huge shock. It's Timing's not great, but timing never is going to be great, is it? So, but... but I knew straight away. I don't know. As soon as, like, the... I missed my period, I knew that something wasn't right because that's not like me, I'm normally very regular. And I was getting tummy cramps, so I was a bit kind of like, you know, well maybe it is just dragging out and everything. But when it got to about five days, I thought, no, this isn't, something's going on here. <laughs> I said, well, I've got the present for you. It's a bit too wrapped up, so I'm going to have to give you a clue, and I just handed him the pregnancy test. And uh, it just didn't register, did it? I think, I think brain just kind of, well, I felt it obviously and looked at it and it just didn't register at all. Um, I suppose and then all of a sudden the penny drops, you know, and uh, well, tell me for joy. Look at it, chuck it in the... Hang on a minute, that's not supposed to be there. Because we'd, we'd only been together about four months but we'd gotten really, really close. I mean, Mark moved, moved in with me about a month into the relationship, so we were living together. So we knew each other really, really well. Um, but we were both really happy. Staring at the box and staring at the stick and thinking, no, that's, that one's wrong, that one's wrong. And I couldn't decide whether the box had been marked wrong or the pregnancy test had come out wrong, and it was like, Mm. One of them's wrong. <laughs> I just don't get it. Hang on. I wake up the next mo morning, have a very strange taste in my mouth, a metallic taste. And I also feel something go and pop and flutter in my tummy, where I know I can remember driving home from work one day and thinking, I'm pregnant. My period wasn't due, there was no way I could know, but there was a... Ma I even know the space on the road during that journey when I had that instant realisation that I was going to have a baby. No, that's positive. 
And I just went and rang mum and it was like, Mum, come home. Wee! <laughs> just look at it, just look at it. And she, even she was standing there like, now you sure it isn't wrong? It was like, no, no, if they're positive, that's when it's right. And she was like, well, it says you're pregnant. When I first found out I was pregnant, instead of that delight that you feel when you see that line, because I I really didn't expect I could get pregnant. I mean, I it was a bolt out of the blue. I really didn't think I could. So after about doing the seven tests that you do to think, is it real, is it real? Um, I started to get scared again and I was really frightened that it'd be another ectopic and that is so common for women that have had previous ectopic pregnancies to, to have that fear. I was happy because I'm sure there will be good times but it was like this is the end of it, this is the absolute end of it. Then it was like I'm actually going to be a mum and it was quite, it was really emotional, mm. really really emotional. It'd be lovely to have a baby again. But this is the last time. <laughs> Coming up next, indigestion. Yeah, what's it called? It, it just goes up. Oh, oh, it was horrible. I've never had that before. When it strikes, it is horrible. How to choose a pram. There is so much choice out there, and we do try and make it a little bit easier for them, and we don't start off with saying, you must have this, you must have that. It really is individual to the person. And going back to work. I went back when she was um, eight weeks old. She came into work with me in her push chair. If I had my own way, I wouldn't go back to work at all. And he would never leave home. He'd always be with me. When it strikes, it is horrible. It's absolutely agonising, hence the industrial amount of peppermint tea. <laughs> Indigestion is common in pregnancy, especially in the later stages. It's thought to be brought on by pressure from the growing baby on the stomach and intestine. But it can be really painful, um, especially if you're not used to having indigestion normally, which I'm not, but I do get really bad heartburn and just that, that awful burning feeling. Yeah, what's it called? It, it just goes up. Oh, oh, it was horrible. I've never had that before. So yeah, loads of Gaviscon. If you're suffering from heartburn, this is caused by stomach acids passing back up through the esophagus. There are a few simple things one can do to help ease the discomfort. Eat small amounts more frequently rather than big heavy meals. Avoid fatty and spicy foods. Try not to eat too late in the evening, so that by bedtime the food has had a chance to be digested. And if necessary, sleep with extra pillows. And then get towards the last couple of months where you have the heartburn, which is not nice. And that's when you buy Gaviscon, buy the litre bottle. And, you know, you just... Gaviscon is like in your hand all day, every day. There are a few old wives' tales which some women believe like a baby with a good head of hair will cause indigestion and heartburn. Although there's no firm evidence to support this theory, lots of women with very fine-haired babies will also suffer from these problems. I did have heartburn with Stephanie. She came out with a full head of hair. Uh, and I have had more severe heartburn with this one, even where I've had to actually take indigestion tablets, which I never had to with Stephanie. So I don't know how hairy this one's going to be. Using antacids brought over the counter at the pharmacy may help. But if you're taking iron tablets, take the antacids at a different time, as the absorption of iron can be affected by them. So uh, this one's really going to come out with massive black hair. <laughs>
Um, it's, a, it's a lovely pram. It weighs nine kilograms, so a little bit heavier, but you can have the baby facing you. They made it very easy. I mean, three or four years ago, it was, it was quite difficult. This particular system um, actually wins quite a few awards because really, I mean, it does everything you want it to, but you've also got the size. You've got the baby facing you. <clears throat> you've got everything you, you want, which is basically the little top apron. You get a rain cover with it, hood, all the padded liners in there. Um, and all you do, say, for the first six months, you have the baby facing this way. And then just by removing the hood and the apron. So you really get the benefit of both, you say, with the baby facing you. It's quite important now. I think they're doing quite a big campaign on it at the moment. Mm. Um, it's interacting with the baby. And car seat adapters already involved in the system. As I say, if you are getting on a bus, and that's the next size up, really easy to carry. Fits most cars, and also it does stand up. So again, if you are in a flat, you can have it on just by the side of the wall rather than just laying on the floor. There are also pram systems, which incorporate a baby seat. What, we, what you'd do, you'd use this one from, say, uh, 0 to 9 months, uh, 0 to 12 months, and then you'll go into the next stage. Um, but it is very handy. The only thing that you've got to get um, used to is that the child can only be in there for a maximum of about two hours uh, because of the client seat. So if you are out for a longer period of time, really you do need to go into, into the push chair because it's got a full lie back. Long journeys, two hours at a time, you've got to stop for at least 20 minutes to half an hour. When we do explain it to uh, some people, some people do go into the, the 0 to 4 year car seat because the recline is so much better on it um, and they can stay in them a lot longer. Once you've finished with that sort of size, if you wanted something where the baby faces, faces you but then there's also a carry cot involved onto it so you can sleep the baby at night time, um, it does end up being a little bit bigger and a little bit weightier. So, again, this sort of this sort of size, we wouldn't recommend uh, people if, if if they are um, living in flats um, and basically getting it onto buses. Now, the clips just come off. Most of them are, uh, the adapters are on the side, so they just come off that easy. The the chassis, which ends up being separate, and this is where the size comes in because because it's two separate units, it ends up being much bigger. Yeah. Just for the chassis, that. The push chair that and if you compare it to the weight's almost double that really does all of what that does but the size is much so much smaller so that's why this particular push chair does very very well this particular model you can actually buy the push chair as a single unit and then two or three years down the line there is an option to actually put a seat onto the push chair which just clips onto the front the newborn goes in there the toddler seat Clips onto the uh, clips onto the front, and it's a fantastic twin push chair. Um, folding size is really easy; just clips down and folds like that. Again, you can actually take all the wheels off. So if you are travelling, uh, you need a little bit more space. All the wheels just pop off by press studs. And if you've got two babies, um, something like this, we'd recommend if you if you've got a big car or if you are doing a lot of walking along seafront, or if you do live in on the coast um, and you've got space for something like this. There are alternatives, um, there are buggy um, twin push chairs out there which do fold in a little bit smaller, um, but it is very difficult for people that have got twins. There's a lot of push chairs that are really not practical. Um, there's not many manufacturers that, that have actually managed to make a twin push chair that's gonna be really, really lightweight, that's practical to go through the door, that fits in the car. Unfortunately, that you know that hasn't been des really designed mm. yet. And finally, a more traditional pram. Sadly, not not a lot of people buy these anymore. But I, I in my personal opinion, I think they're great. I, I think if you've got the space, and not necessarily the money, because you know they are pretty much the same as all the other push chairs. It's completely flat. A lot of push chairs are not completely flat nowadays. They're slightly raised, uh, which is the legal requirement. It's um, but. I think babies are actually nicer to be completely flat um, for the first six months. So you've got the carry cot, but this is where, again, we come into size. You've got this unit here, lovely to have, but uh, for a lot of people, the cars, if, if you've got a small car, you really, you really can't have anything like this. There is so much choice out there, and we do try and make it a little bit easier for them, and we don't start off 
we're saying you must have this, you must have that. It really is individual to the person, so um, <clears throat> hopefully we do get it right. Some shops offer an after-sales service where, if the goods are faulty, they'll supply you with a courtesy pram whilst yours is being repaired. With extra financial pressures these days, most women find that after they've had their maternity leave, they need to resume work. For many, this can be quite a wrench. Emma runs her own hairdressing salon, and when Evie was born, she was able to go back to work on her terms. Now that she has her new baby, Poppy, she slipped into the same routine. I went back when she was um, eight weeks old. She came into work with me in her pushchair and got cooed over all day by hundreds of women and I'm positive that's what's made her a very sociable child because she wasn't allowed to be um, whingy or shy or anything because she was being passed around the salon and being kissed and, and cooed over all day so uh, it wasn't easy it was quite difficult trying to work out when I was going to do the feeding but Evie was very and always has been a very routine baby she would be having her bottle every four hours so I knew um, what cry was was what? When I go back, it'll be six till nine, so I'm not going to be out for very long. So I'll probably only have to ex at, by that point. I'll probably only need to do one bottle for when I go out. Physically and emotionally, I'm still recovering, <coughs> um, especially physically because that was hard work. So I couldn't have gone back to a full time job. Um, so I'm just doing twenty two hours a week, and it it suits me just fine. It's a Secretarial jobs, so I'm not having to think too much. <laughs> Use my brain. I mean, obviously, if I had my own way, I wouldn't go back to work at all. And he would never leave home. He'd always be with me. Um, but obviously, you know, with one income coming in, it's, it is stretched. But yeah, it'd be nice to get back to work and see everyone again. And it also means that I get home. <laughs> Early every day, I can spend some time with the children um, and see him roll over and sitting up because you're clear back. Oh, and, like that. <laughs> <laughs> and he can fall over on his eye all by himself. <laughs> oh, it'd be nice to be Daisy for an evening. So although it may be a wrench for mums like Daisy and Emma, going back to work is just what they needed and it helps.